Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show, audio only out of Chicago. Uh, me and Ben were reading Lori Lightfoot, uh, the mayor, her Yelp profile, which is pretty spectacular, as you would imagine it would be. Everything Lori Lightfoot does, everything she wears, every expression she makes or doesn't make, the pitch of her raspy voice, her turn of phrase, her kind of blank look, the stare, when she just stares at a reporter. There's, there's nothing about Lori Lightfoot that I don't love. Truly. Yeah, I only want to talk to black reporters. Constantly with the race card. Constantly with the gay sexuality card. The, the, the misogyny card. I mean, I, I, again, a true Batman villain. A true corrupt goon. Her local feuds with Burger King Ed, the disgraced city council member, as they fight over a Burger King renovation. Her winning in a runoff election against some other idiot. Preckwinkle? Tony yeah, Preckwinkle. whatever. I mean, just the idea that this woman is is the mayor of Chicago. It's like an, it's a real city, right? So there's something very interesting about um, Lori Lightfoot to me. There, there's something interesting that somebody like her is able to climb the ranks to become the mayor of Chicago. And and you found her Yelp profile. Yeah, shout from, out to the person that sent me this from, from when before she was mayor. Yeah, yes, yeah, so this is from. Uh, what was she doing then? Oh, interesting. I wonder what like, she was doing. What was she doing? We don't know much about Lori Lightfoot pre mayor. Yeah, I don't know. Did I've... she just become the mayor of <laughs> Chicago? There had to be some run up to that, right? Yeah. I'm I'm curious as to what what is what job do you have before you become the mayor of Chicago? Like, did she... Oh, she worked in private legal practice as a partner at Mayor Brown and held various government positions in Chicago. Most notably, she served as president of the Chicago Police Board and chair of the Chicago Police Accountability Task Force. Wow. So they love her. Dude, we passed Lightfoot's house. The cops are sitting outside. Mm -hmm. The cops look like they would not do anything if you ran in there with a gun. <laughs> like, Truly. Like, the cops are sitting there fighting the urge to run into the house with a gun. <laughs> the faces of the cops sitting in the patrol cars outside Lori Lightfoot's house, they're basically like, hey, man, do what you got to do. I mean, could there be a less enthusiastic position mm -hmm. for those people? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not fans of Lori. Now, I want you to read, because this is... A, this shows the type of person she is. I have never yelped anything in my life. Like, mm -hmm. I've never written a Yelp review. I've had, as we know on this show, I've been quite vocal about my many run-ins mm -hmm. with people. Um, I don't rat. I entertain. I talk about it on the show. I do not rat. I do not make a written report of uh, a problem that I've had with a business. It's not, it's not who I am. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of people who do. Tons of them. And they think it's okay. They think it's good. They think they're doing uh, something virtuous by warning other people about the calamari at La Abundanza. They have to make sure that people know to avoid the fucking minestrone soup at fucking Mateo's whatever. Mm. They're, they're committed. They will single out waiters and waitresses by name. And I've read these reviews. They, it fascinates me. I did a comedy show once for members of like, I forget what it's called, the Yelp 500 or something. These people had posted so many reviews on Yelp, so many reviews that they were like in the elite tier of Yelpers, like sick people, right? And they came to this comedy show uh, or I was booked on a comedy show for them. And as you would imagine, uh, the worst audience in the world. Mm -hmm judgmental, like people that were looking at the glassware that they were serving the drinks in, like, is this right? Is this correct? Like, miserable people. People who have nothing going on. People whose entire life is uh, to be a critic. Uh, and, and, and what's great about Yelp is, like, that's not your job. Mm -hmm. There's a great history of criticism, right? In, in theater, in, in movies, film, and in, in uh, dining, you know, 
but but it's not your job to be a critic. So you've taken it upon yourself to give yourself another job you don't get paid for, which is to like Paul Revere <laughs> ride through the fucking uh, woods telling people what they should avoid on this planet. Because God forbid someone else gets duped. Now, by the way, this is the reality. Nobody yelps to help other people. That's a fact. There is not one person who's ever written a Yelp review because they are concerned that somebody else is going to have a bad time at that establishment. That is the common defense of people yes. who write Yelp reviews. They're like, well, if I don't tell people fucking to fucking watch their back at this particular Denny's, then who will? And it's like no no one cares about a stranger walking in and dealing with the same rude, incompetent service. What they are doing is they're doing it to shame, to punish, to call out because they know companies read these reviews. When I was a tour guide, we used to get reviews on TripAdvisor and we'd get bonuses if they mentioned our name in a five-star review. And a lot of times they would mention my name and they would be like, um, you know, he was horrible. And then you would get talked to. They would bring you in and they'd go, hey, man, we're getting these reviews about you. And, um, you know, so so the idea that Lori Lightfoot is a yelper is beautiful. <laughs> the idea that Lori Lightfoot worked in government her whole life, worked on the police accountability task force. So we know she loves accountability. Mm -hmm. Okay? And... There's something great about her. Now, this is a Yelp review of when she... So this is from August 2017, and this is a review of a party bus rental place, a limo it's, and party bus. It's buses. a limo. So Lightfoot is going out on the town. Mm -hmm. Is she married at that point? Yes, because she mentions her wife in this. So Lightfoot is married, and yes. she's going out on the town. Now, we don't know to what. Do we know? No, it just says she's using the service VIP limousine, and she gave them one star. She's using the VIP limousine service in <laughs> Chicago. And she's going out on the town, and she's unhappy with how this played out. Lori Lightfoot, now mayor of Chicago, very unhappy with the service being given to her by VIP limousine. Now... Go into this. I want you to read the review because what's great about this is the company does something mm. that companies rarely do. Mm. They rarely do this. They call her out mm -hmm. as not only uh, a liar, <laughs> okay, but an abusive <laughs> person. And companies usually just write, thanks for the review, we're going to get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. You've seen what companies write. Mm. Thank you so much. But this is the this is the reality. This company had had enough. They had had enough. VIP Limo of Chicago, all due respect, calls Lori Lightfoot out. Now, Ben is going to read this review mm. posted when? Uh, 2017. And here is Lori. I would never use VIP limo again. Driver Carlos showed up early for our pickup. A good sign, right? Turned out not to be so. Well, I'm going to read it the way she wrote it. Turned out not be so. Carlos shows Turned up. Turned out not be so. <laughs> yes. Now, one of two things is happening. <laughs> Lori is using the parlance of the streets or... Or she's angrily typing, which I think is probably more likely. Yeah. Lori is enraged mm -hmm. typing this review. Mm -hmm. So so she's not not every word might not be, but the general message is going to come through. Mm -hmm. Continue. Carlos shows up and wants to use our bathroom. A little strange, but fine. Turns out he pisses in our toilet and does not have the courtesy to put down the toilet seats. Beginning of the end. We were going to the United Center. Carlos clearly has no idea who to get there. 
He is totally reliant on a whacked GPS system that has him driving his huge Cadillac Escalade stretch down extremely narrow neighborhood streets, going in a route that made no sense. I had to take over and give him clear directions to get to the expressway. Apparently, that was totally emasculating to him. But how says, my GPS says I should get off at Division off the expressway when we are going much further south and west. We finally get there, and he says he needs two numbers for the return pickup. We had already given the person paying. Oh, wait. We had already given him one from my female spouse. I say I will just give him mine since I am the person paying. Carlos says, I need one from the gentleman. I am totally confused and question this. Carlos explains to this dumb female that he needs a number from a guy because girls take too many pictures and run down the battery on their phone. My expression must have said something because then he's then said, trust me, I have been doing this 20 years. I'm a middle-aged woman, not some dumb kid from his misogynistic worldview. I, of course, gave it to him, and his response was to rudely close the window divider while I was talking. The guy was a complete a-hole. Stupid, terrible driver and a complete jerk on top of it. Can't believe he is employed and I would never use the service again while he is. Lori Lightfoot reviewing her trip to the United Center <laughs> where she went with her spouse and an unspecified gentleman mm -hmm. to some event. Mm -hmm. Very angry at Carlos, the limo driver, <laughs> for not knowing what to do. She got mad at him for traveling down suburban streets. He pissed on the all over the toilet. Pissed lid. on the toilet. Now here, here is the the business owner's response. The turn. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a turn. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a real turn here. <laughs> Because as let us all remember, this woman is in charge of one of the largest cities in America. Yes. This is a real turn. This is what they call uh, a reveal. If you're a fan of, of uh, dramatic terminology. Because mm -hmm. we now find out that Lori's character is called into question <laughs> by the good people. Dare I say good people at VIP Limousine. <laughs> In Chicago. Remember, this opened up with Lori very puzzled about a man showing up to use the bathroom and then pissing all over her seat, which she then called the beginning of the end. Here is the statement from the Chicago VIP limo. One, our driver did not use your bathroom. We checked the vehicle cameras and he did not enter your home. You had lots of guests over and of them could have done what you claim our wonderful driver Carlos did. Two, our drivers have GPS systems that work with current events and traffic. Chicago Austin often has festivals and we have to work our way around them. It is not your place to tell him how to do his job. Three, our drivers ask for a gentleman's phone number actually because they don't ever want to seem inappropriate asking for a lady's phone number. And you should appreciate that Carlos took the time to ask for a backup phone number in case you lose signal or battery. Again, our drivers know what they are doing and have experience. Now, here's the final paragraph here. It seems to me the only person here who is sexist, my dear, is you. I don't know where you come to your conclusion that you were emasculating him. Maybe you hoped you were. Your language is horrendous and lewd. Just your rant here make me feel embarrassed for you. Also, wow. That's pretty insulting that you refer to women who like to take a lot of pics at their events as dumb females. Your driver arrived early. He got you on time and safely to your event. Your credit card you provided on the contract was declining. We even let you use a different credit card for payment, which is against our rules. And you received an upgraded vehicle twice the price of what you paid without any upcharge as a free upgrade from our company. Wish I could review customers like you. Find something better to do with your time, and you should appreciate great service when you receive it. Wow. I mean, you want to talk about the SmackDown. You want to talk about a total and utter embarrassment. Yeah. Can I am just enjoying picturing her face reading that. Her expressionless face reading this, which shuts her down mm -hmm. completely. The guy did not leave his car. So this, this woman mm. made up. She made up yes. that he went into her house and pissed on her seat. Mm. She just made that up. She pulled that out of thin air, mm. if we are to believe these people, which I don't see any reason why not. By the way, it's the fact that's why they took everything else with a grain of salt. 
They caught her Im- immediately in a lie. So then they go, well, now we're just, because that was one of the harshest responses I have ever seen a company give. <laughs> so you know that they are confident that they are in the right. They are confident that they're 100% in the right. I have never seen a statement from a company delivered with such venom as, as the, the correction to Lori Lightfoot's slander. You know who this person is. Like, you know who Lori is. She's, yes. um, a, you know, you want to talk about a bureaucrat. You want to talk about uh, 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 somebody who is pushy, rude, demanding, likes getting people in trouble, likes calling people out, does not like to be called out, does not like to be responsible for their own behavior, mm. invents versions of of interactions that did not happen, as long as the person looks horrible, likes people getting fired, (laughs) likes people getting shamed, likes people losing money. This is the type of person who we're dealing with, truly. And I couldn't love her more. (laughs) I couldn't feel more of an affection for this woman and a gratitude that she's on the planet because my entertainment is so important to me Mm. because the world is... Is, is is really trite. And yet this is great. Now, yes, if I was someone who lived in a, one of these places in Chicago that was, you know, suffering from inordinately, and I mean to say inordinately, but high rates of homicide, uh, the city is falling apart, sure. Not her fault, but she's clearly not helping. Sure. I would maybe find it less humorous. But the fact that I don't live anywhere near her, and I can just, I don't, I have, there's no... I don't deal with any of the repercussions from her personal behavior, which is, as we've seen, atrocious. <laughs> to me, she's just a very entertaining person. The ill-fitting suits, the fedoras, the blank stare, you know, the dancing. She, she's like on camera dancing with people. She has no conscience, Lori Lightfoot. And that is what I like about her. She will lie about a limo driver and say he pissed in her house to get him fired. She has no conscience. It is what allows her to dance as people are getting shot. Children are getting shot in the face. She dances. She has no conscience. She's a true villain. (laughs) Truly, all the things we find abominable in the world, abhorrent, all of the, the personality types that we want to avoid, the nanny, the rat, the Karen, the... The person who, you know, keeps the receipts and tries to, you know, uh, you know, get somebody fired, embarrass somebody. This is this is who she is. And this is how she runs Chicago. A petty, vindictive chief executive who will not take any blame, similar to Trump. She has a lot of Trump esque qualities. The leaders are somewhat similar. The leaders, I wonder if there's something to that. (laughs) At the end of America, the leaders have similar qualities. They are craven narcissists without, they refuse to take any responsibility and they live in a version of reality that they find uh, best. But they do not, uh, as Chris Hedges says, they are disconnected from reality, like all of these people that are running these big corrupt machines that are failing, like Chicago, are unwilling to live in reality because reality is not fun. Reality is not fun. And you can see it in one Yelp review. What's fascinating is that in one Yelp review, you can get a glimpse of the type of person. Can you imagine the Trump Yelp reviews that he would have written? Oh, yeah. Had that been around? The credit card declining would be there, too. I the mean, same review. The, thing that, yeah. the things that he would do and say, mm-hmm. because that's, you know, an attribute of their personalities. You know? It's perhaps why they succeed. It's perhaps why they succeed because what this what what it allows them to do is they are in their mind they have a god complex and anyone that is not worshiping them at any moment has to be thrown under the bus. You saw Trump did it with a lot of his underlings, he did it with a lot of his supporters, 
Lightfoot it does it with everybody, I'm sure. It's a common theme amongst this like personality type. But again, a, a huge fan of her. Uh, and I wish her the best <laughs> because nothing to me is better than someone who wears baggy pants like her her pants don't fit and she's standing there. You got to get that photo up of her if you haven't yeah. seen her. Yeah. And she's just standing there staring blankly, mm -hmm. you know? The pant leg is going under the heel of the shoe. Yes. She's walking on her pants. Yes. They're so long. Yes. That is what a goon does. That is what a villain <laughs> does. It, 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 is, it is so important as a villain, uh, as a troll. And she is a troll of the highest order. <laughs> her lack of care about her appearance is because, again, she doesn't live in reality. She's living in a world where the pants fit. She's living in a world where they're turning the corner on the shootings. She's living in a world where the limo driver pissed all over her couch. <laughs> and, and that world has elected her mayor of Chicago. So why not? Just like Trump, he became the president. Why not? Right? Reality really in many cases, is an obstacle to what you want to do and where you want to go. And a lot of these people have figured that out. It's not going to get better. People are now wearing N95 masks in uh, West Coast just because of the wildfire smoke. God bless anyone buying a home in L.A. God bless you. As you've said, you believe that a lot of this is going to get bad and the West Coast... And yeah, parts and the of the Northwest south are just going to become uninhabitable. Uninhabitable. Whoa. Yeah. When? Uh, really by like 2080. Who says? Just things I read from top guys. It's going to get bad. Yeah, it's going to get bad. People are going to go to Wisconsin, up to the Northeast, places like that. Parts of Montana a little bit, but... And then Canada. Canada. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Mm. What we're trying to do is, is find a, a place to just keep our head above water. Mm -hmm. Leaving Austin, Texas very soon. Our long national nightmare is over. You saw the, the movers come. You watched the movers come and take the furniture out. They took it out. Emotional. Yeah. How uh, about how many months? And again, I'll be there the, through the end of the year. Uh, on and off. February through, I guess, October. I guess she's. February. When I first arrived in Austin, there was a biblical snowstorm. Biblical. That knocked out power. People couldn't get food. Certain parts of the city had no clean water. Mm -hmm. A smarter man would have seen that as a sign. A smarter man, but Tim Dillon, not always intelligent, has a lot of heart, but not always thinking. Um, but there was a part of me that did uh, believe that potentially this was a sign. That all was not going to be well. All was not going to be well. When I'm driving through Texas in a snowstorm, first in over 100 years, mm -hmm. I should have maybe said to myself, is this a sign telling me that this is not going to work out? And we tried. We gave it our all. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't try that hard because my all isn't that much. <laughs> my all is not that much. I'm 36 years old. I'm, and I know that people are like, that's young, and it's not. Here's the deal. It's really not. If you are my age, let me tell you something. You do not have your whole life ahead of you. That is a lie. In fact, you never have your whole life ahead of you, really. No matter what age you are. Because no one knows when it's over. So the idea that when somebody goes, you have your whole life ahead of you, you can't live thinking that. You don't have your whole life ahead of you. 36 years. You have to know what you like and know what you can stand and know what you can tolerate. If at 36, you are still on the fence about anything, you're insane. <laughs> if you don't know your sexuality, if you don't know your gender, if you don't know what makes you come, if you don't know what kind of movies you like, if you don't know whether you like to read a book at night or go get coked out and fucked on a pool table, you don't know who you are at 36 years old. You're probably not going to find out. And you know what? You don't want to. 
God forbid you find out who you are at 36. It may terrify you. You should have an idea. 36, what kind of person are you? Are you a coffee house person or do you want to see them blown up? I'm the latter. Does Lori Lightfoot represent positive change to you? You should know this. Are you a person who leaves a Yelp review and lies about a limo driver to try to get him fired? Are you getting in skirmishes with Uber drivers at 36? Is that who you are? Are you in the closet lying to people about who you fuck because you're embarrassed about the things you like and you're afraid about people finding out who you truly are because you may get less invites to the game or whatever. And I'm not saying anyone has to come out. But but are you that person? Because you know who you are at 36. I'm too old to pretend that I can fucking make it work. It will not work. <laughs> Nothing. Not a friendship. I know. I Somebody flew in to hang out with us a month <laughs> ago. And they got in the car. I don't even hate this person. But I don't like them. They were a younger person, not sexual thing, not anything, just a dude to hang out. I ended up pulling over in a parking lot, making up some excuse, and putting this person out of my car. It was about under an hour. We had spent under an hour with them, maybe an hour. I am done letting things go, is my point. They flew from Florida, from Miami to New York to hang out with us. Yeah. After an hour of their behavior and their antics, I decided that it was time to move on. As you get older, everything's about brevity. You got it's got to be quick. You got to know, and you're gonna go. You cannot suffer endlessly. There's no value in that. You know, it, 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 it's about knowing what's going on and moving the fuck on. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. You know, I found myself in Austin. I found myself going, I can do it. I can figure it out. I can, I can adapt. I'm not adaptable, really. I, I've earned the right. Er, by the way, here's a fuck. I'm going full fucking motivation today. Earn, and I want you to look at your lover, partner, friend, mother, father, and go, if you've, I have earned the right to not be adaptable. Earn that right. Earn the right to not be adaptable. I am not adaptable. I saw someone say to their boyfriend once, they said, you're so adaptable. I thought that was the biggest insult I had ever heard in my life. I, I, I wished he turned around and cracked her in the mouth. And I'm against domestic violence. So you can only, in most cases, some half, half of the cases I'm against it. A good half of the time, I think it's wrong. But the point is that you know that uh, that is an insult. Adaptable is an insult. Malleable is an insult. Earn the right to draw a line in the sand and say, no, thank you. I don't want to go there. I don't like them. I don't want to deal with it. I was laying in bed with COVID. It was a mild case, you know, because I was vaccinated, but really because I got the Regeneron. Whatever. Everyone I know who's vaccinated has COVID and is dying. But whatever. I guess that's what was supposed to happen. Every day, they, they, they literally tell you less and less to expect from the vaccine. Like You're like, I have it. I, I probably won't get it, right? They're like, oh, no, you'll get it. Yeah, but I won't get sick. Oh, you'll get sick. Yeah, but I won't die. You'll probably die. It's, and I'm not saying to not get it or whatever, but let's be honest. This hasn't worked out ideally. Can we be honest and say that the vaccine has not been ideal? Can we say it hasn't been ideal? I can smell half of what I used to smell. I'm three weeks out. I don't know that the rest is coming back. Can we, can we just say that it's not been ideal? And yes, does it keep you from dying? The numbers say that. And I hope that's true. I hope it's true, but we can admit that we had hoped for more with the Biden presidency. Can we admit that perhaps we had hoped for more? It's not inspiring. It's not an inspiring presidency, is it? That this dementia patient comes out now. I'm for the Afghanistan withdrawal. We should have done it a long fucking time ago. Um, but when you see this pale 
skin and bones rag, this flesh suit, walking out to deliver remarks after these servicemen have been tragically killed. Can we say that it's just not ideal? Is that allowed? Is it allowed to recognize imperfections when they are obvious to us? So at 36, I have earned the right, and I hope you have earned the right, to not be adaptable, to have things you don't like. I don't like Ethiopian food. And, I, and it has nothing to do with, uh, I've tried it. I think I love other types of African food. I don't like the squishiness of it. And I'm sure there's Ethiopian food that's not squishy. I, but I don't care. So don't email me. But the, the squishiness of it, the idea that everything's kind of like some type of applesauce, I don't like it. And I don't need to prove a point by going to an Ethiopian restaurant. I know I'm not racist. So I don't need to do it. It's not for me. I love goat. Mm -hmm. Give me goat. But I know what I like. There, there's got to be a point where you, you say to yourself, I can't function uh, in a city like Austin, Texas, which is a schizophrenic place, a place full of like the worst kind of red state morons and the worst kind of liberal. It's a collision of the biggest morons that you've ever met, near do wells, C list, D list, except for like Rogan and Musk. It's a. a Everyone's psychotic. Everyone you meet, whether it's in the tech space or anything, has a big idea and a big dream. It's nice that New York and L.A. have beaten the dreams out of people. Beaten them, beaten them, beaten them out. So the people you meet are not completely crazy. When you talk to people in Austin, they have wide-eyed things. They go, I'm going to start my own city. And you go, okay, thank you. And you just back away slowly, keeping them in your view in case they get physically unpredictable. There's something about the wide-eyed nature of Austin that reminds you of Brooklyn circa 2012, one of the worst places ever in history. Wide-eyed people, myself, I was one of them, who believed that stand-up comedy was medicine <laughs> and it was going to save and help me. And all the people I had around me were going to have that beautiful experience. It was going to be transcendent. And we were going to live and love and laugh forever. Well, it doesn't work. Close your eyes. Austin's going to be nothing but a shit L.A. that smells like pork chops. And your dreams are the things that will eventually tie a noose around your neck and hang you from the tree. And the sooner you get to that position, the smarter you'll be. Don't be adaptable. Don't be adaptable. I've earned the right. Blue Chew, everybody. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable tablets at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night. So you can plan ahead or just be ready whenever. The best part, it's all done online. Blue Chew helps give you the confidence in the bedroom. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped directly to your door in a discreet package, okay? It is great. Everybody loves Blue Chew, whether or not you even have a penis. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, Blue Chew can help. They've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code TD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's Blue Chew. Promo code TD to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. It's so important to have Blue Chew around whenever you need it for friends, family, whatever. It's beautiful. Not that you're going to have sex with your friends and family, but who knows? I don't know what the laws are where you live. The point is that as long as everyone's of age and consenting, you should be able to have sex with your family. Truly. Incest is like the final taboo. Blue Chew. Keeps. You got to keep your hair. One of my good friends is using this and they love it. 
Keeps offers a simple, stress-free way to keep your hair. Convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door every three months. You don't have to leave your home. Low cost. Treatments start at $10 per month and Keeps offers generic versions. Discreet packaging and proven results. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. Prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so act fast. This is a great way to keep the hair you have on your head. I'm telling you. It's important. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, Go to keeps.com, that's K-E-E-P-S.com slash Tim Dillon to receive your free first month of treatment. Free first month. That's K-E-E-P-S.com slash Tim Dillon to get your first month free. I'm telling you, one of my friends uses this service, really likes it, and he's noticed a a difference. He stopped losing his hair, and he's really excited about that. Um, That's K-E-E-P-S.com slash Tim Dillon. Spike Lee, sadly, genius, acting a little adaptable, doing a 9-11 documentary on what, on HBO? HBO. HBO 9-11 Four part series. Was going to include some 9-11 uh, skeptics, mm-hmm. people that are skeptical of the official narrative. Specifically the conspiracy group Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Yes. Mm. Now... What happened, Ben? You've been following this. Did the media have a cow? So two days ago in the New York Times, this was the end of the interview where he says, uh, they say the last step, and by the way, this isn't out if you're wondering why you haven't seen this. Members of the media have have seen episodes already. So the uh, journalist says, the last episode of the series devotes a lot of time to questioning how and why the towers fell. You interview several members of the conspiracy group Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Why did you want to include their perspective? He said, because I still don't, I mean, I got questions. And I hope that maybe the legacy of this documentary is that Congress holds a hearing, a congressional hearing about 9-11. And he says, you don't buy the official explanations? And Spike says, the amount of heat that it takes to make steel melt, that temperature is not reached. And then the juxtaposition of the way Building 7 fell to the ground, when you put it next to other building collapses that were demolitions, it's like you're looking at the same thing. But people going to make up their own mind. My approach is put the information in the movie and let people decide for themselves. I respect the intelligence of the audience. And then the journalist says this, right. But you don't say make up your own mind about whether or not the vaccine is poison or make up your own mind about whether Joe Biden was legitimately elected. Spike says, people are going to think what they think regardless. I'm not dancing around your question. People are going to think what they think. People have called me a racist for do the right thing. People said in Mo Betta Blues, I was anti-Semitic. She's got to have it that I was a misogynist. People are going to just think what they think. And you know what? I'm still here going on four decades of filmmaking. And I respect that. Mm -hmm. And I respect his thing of like, why are you going to do a documentary about 9-11 without putting in... By the way, these are not... See, this is what gaslighting is. And I hate that word. I hate the new terminology, Mm -hmm. right? But isn't gaslighting the type of thing where you're made to feel insane? Yes, exactly. Right. So when you ask these questions that are realistic, logical questions, like, hey, Building 7, what's up with that? Okay? (laughs) Normal, rational questions going, this doesn't look like anything except it looks like a demolition. Mm. It doesn't look like anything that's ever happened in the way that a fire is taking something out. When you ask that very rational question, you are gaslighted. You're made to believe that you were insane. You go, oh, well, what about the vaccine? What about Biden? You think we landed on the moon? Oh, yeah. What are you, one of those guys? Oh, lizard people live underground, huh? You go, no, I didn't say any of that. I'm simply asking a fucking question because I have senses. I have eyes and ears, and it seems fucking weird. That's all. Isn't it weird? If you told someone it was weird, that 15 hijackers from Saudi Arabia attacked the, the biggest military power ever seamlessly and very successfully, and then that military power went in on to in, invade Iraq and Afghanistan and countries that really didn't have much to do with this. And this was all directed by Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And uh, we censored 17 pages in the 9-11 report that were damaging to our uh, our ally, Saudi Arabia. And uh, the 9-11 Commission chair said we were set up to fail and we didn't have the resources and the information that we wanted. And the president would only testify with the vice president in a like ventriloquism session that they had in front of this commission. If you were to, to take all of that and if, if, if knowing what we know about the government and what they're what they've done and what they're capable of, to even like Spike Lee, a brilliant director, a smart guy, a guy who understands questions. That's what art is. Great art. 
He understands, why can't I ask these questions? We don't know what the answer is. Mm. We don't know where it's going to go. When you start writing a novel, you don't always know the end. Mm. You don't know. You, the work grows. It changes. It evolves. Why can't we ask the questions? When people are shutting down the questions, it's a whole new level of a problem. The answers are one thing. You can fight about answers. But if you shut down the questions, you, you can't even get to the answers. So the idea that there's a coordinated attempt to smear Spike Lee for including a small, what, half hour? It was a half hour of the last episode, which, by the way, 24 hours later after this article, after the media firestorm. Yeah, what happens? Tell us what so, happens. So as it stands now, this journalist says they went and watched uh, the uh, HBO sent out an email to Critics Thursday announcing that the screener site was updated with the final edited picture. As it stands now, episode four appears to be exactly 30 minutes shorter than the original version that I watched on Monday, coming in at 90 minutes long instead of two hours. Indeed, the entire segment on the 9-11 conspiracy group and all apparent references to the group appear to have been excised. So it's gone. He just he took it out a day later. And it's the pressure. Mm. It's the pressure that comes from the top. People go, don't, hey, we don't want, you don't want. Mm. Now, in fairness, I did not see the 30 minutes, and it would be hilarious if the 30 minutes was just him like talking to Louis Farrakhan about the Jews. And HBO goes, I got to be honest with you. And Louis Farrakhan's like, when the Jews put the fuses in the buildings. And I understand that that could be offensive. Absent that, absent that, I imagine it was an exploration of, of people's uh, skepticism about the official narrative, which is now completely amputated, completely removed from the final product, the finished product. It sucks. So now you have an eight-hour documentary about 9-11. They don't mention anything about the conspiracy itself. Well, sure. I think, you know, I was talking to Ray about it earlier. I said, what is the percentage of people who believe the official story of 9-11? I don't believe... By the way, when I say that, and I want you to listen to this. You're in your car, or you're you're on a treadmill. It's my fans. You're in your car. (laughs) And whatever. No, we have healthy fans. And whatever it is. You're listening to this. I am not saying, do you believe the Bush administration did 9-11? I'm not saying, do you believe they had foreknowledge of 9-11? By the way, not the worst question. What I'm saying is, do you believe that you know and possess all of the relevant knowledge about the 9-11 attacks? Do you believe that? I don't. Very few people I know believe that. I'm talking about conservative, rah-rah, patriot people that I know, okay, are now, in the last few years, even before Trump, coming to an uncomfortable conclusion that they don't really know what happened in, with the clarity that they would like. That's all. And most people are, I believe, willing and have an open mind about the lengths to which elements of our government will go to cover up criminal, evil behavior. Jeffrey Epstein, prime example. That is evil, criminal behavior. Um, and it's it covered up. So the lengths of which people will go to cover up the behavior, I don't know what happened. I've talked to very smart people that believe the mainstream narrative. I've talked to very smart people that have uh, a lot of questions. I will put myself in the camp that has questions. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think that, didn't Woody Harrelson, wasn't he going to do something with this too? Yes, I actually have this pulled up. Uh, What did Woody, because I think Woody Harrelson as well had some... uh, Ideas or reservations. Here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this because this is an article I found that celebrities that don't buy uh, con- that are into conspiracy. Just call. You want to call her back on the show? Uh, yeah. Just put her up next to your thing. Hey, listen. You're on. Once you're on the podcast, we're doing audio only. Tell everyone about your new show because we we loved it. I listened to about forty five percent of the first episode. Give it a little plug. 
Awakening OD is a guide to the matrix from an eight dimensional uh, galactic being who is assigned to Earth and doesn't want to be here. I loved it. I love how good you are at talking. This is Jessa Reed, and the podcast is called Awakening, and she's insanely good at conveying complex ideas. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that's the fact. I'm just sitting in the ro- a baby's room talking about 9-11 in my Airbnb, which I can't rent because I'm not allowed on Airbnb. Wait, I was going to say they let you back in Airbnb? They absolutely did not. We use another account. <laughs> I'm banned forever. I'm public enemy number one. Airbnb. So I'm sitting in this baby's room talking about 9-11. And this is my career. This is my career. People don't, they think I'm doing well. Monetarily I am, but my career, like it would be nice to walk on a red carpet, you know? I'm in a baby's room talking about building seven. It's not as glamorous as it seems. Why Why are you in a baby's room? Because it has the best, um, what Ben? Uh, Acoustics. Acoustics, because yeah. yeah. it's carpeted. Is Ben with you? Yes. Hi Ben. Hey Jessa. We Ben, you love you love the episode too. Yes, Jessa, we both listen. I I loved it. I I love your stuff about aliens and interdimensional stuff, and I, I you I you make astrology and all that stuff exciting to me. It's 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 the podcast. If you're into that stuff, but you want somebody who's got a very funny, dry take on things, it's very funny, and you're not like one of these white chicks who you want when you hear them talk, you want to kill yourself. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, consciousness for people that hate the New Age movement. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, we got to finish this episode. I'll call you later. All right. All right, thanks, Ben. Bye, guys. Jessa Reed, check that podcast out, Awakening, on YouTube and other podcast platforms. But, again, I'm not adaptable at this point in my in my career. Well, I guess for the right amount of money. If you give me... A hundred million dollars. Here's why I will stop talking about 9-11. Okay. Do you want to know this? And I want my audience to understand this. And what's the number? What's the number of money? I don't know. What did I say? A hundred million dollars? I think so, yeah. Probably eight million dollars. Okay. <laughs> my talking about it has done nothing. <laughs> Do you understand? It hasn't. Congress is not having a hearing. Uh-huh. No one gives a shit, right? In fact, people are annoyed when you bring 9-11 up. I don't even mean truthers. People are just like, hey, man, we're over it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for like, I don't know, $3 million, I'll shut up about it. For $20 million, I will come on the show and talk about why the official story makes sense. I'll start another podcast called 9-11 Did Happen the Way They Said for $20 million. And I will every episode through gritting my teeth and rolling my eyes, or I'll just really believe it. Like, I'll relapse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really. So now, what is Woody Harrelson trying to do? Okay, so uh, he was going to make a movie. It says, because uh, this is an article that says, celebrities that believe in conspiracy theories. Here's the 9-11 section. It says, Martin Sheen's son, Charlie Sheen, was reportedly set to star with Woody Harrelson in a movie called September Morn. Which with Charlie Sheen? With Charlie Sheen. And I believe this was back in 2012 or so when it said it had questioned the official narrative behind 9-11, but the movie never materialized. And then Charlie Sheen went on Alex Jones. I missed this. Did you see him go on Alex Jones? I believe I saw that. I didn't realize there was going to be a movie about it with Charlie Sheen. That sounds fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. And Martin Sheen's a truther, too. Did you know that? Probably. Mm. By the way, I don't think the movie would have accomplished it. The movie probably would have hurt the truther movement. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Charlie Sheen starring in a, a truther movie directed by Woody Harrelson is almost as close to a CIA op as you get because people would have walked out of that theater and went, I guess the government is right. Yeah. You know? But I still would have liked to see it, right? Yeah, it would have been great. You know what I mean? That's like Lori Lightfoot doing like pro-vaccine stuff. You go, do you want people to get it or not? Because no one is being convinced by this goon. Can you get the thing up where... I, we played it on a Patreon. We won't play it. But it's her. She has a great PSA about the vaccine. Oh, yeah. We, yeah, we played it on the Patreon. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
I don't know, man. All I'm saying is that there is a theme to the episode, I think. And part of the theme is there is a level uh, of which you realize, unfortunately, that truly nothing matters. And then you have two choices. One is to develop a strict personal code of ethics of which you follow somewhat religiously. It could include hard work, honesty, integrity, whatever. Or none of the above. It could include none of that. In fact, Mm -hmm. it could be the opposite. It could include lying, manipulation, and sloth. But as long as it's your personal code, it is what will get you through. Mm -hmm. The other thing to do when you realize that nothing really means anything is to join ISIS or some type of death cult, right? There's no real middle ground if you have the realization that things don't mean much. Donald Trump had a great great quote about the Indian earthquake. This is what allows him to be him. And he said something. Anna, Anna from Red Scare had tweeted it or put it on Instagram where he was basically like, can't worry about anything. You worry about things and then 400 people die in an earthquake in India. It doesn't matter. It was some, some approximation of that. And he's right to a degree, right? Like, you know, Kurt Vonnegut said the most successful people are sociopaths because they're constantly doing. They're never thinking about the consequences. They go, do this, do that. The Lori Lightfoots. Yeah, lie about the guy. Yeah, he came in, he pissed all over the kitchen. Fire him. Don't think about him, his family. You don't think about the fact that they have cameras in a car that can tell he didn't fucking leave. Now, you look like an idiot. You don't, you're not even looking out for yourself. The real old school gangsters like H.W. or Joe Kennedy or any of that, you know, they try to look out for themselves too, you know? But it's very hard for people like Lightfoot because they're so impulsive and reckless. And Trump to a degree too, like the new breed of leader, uh, it's very interesting seeing what happens to them, where they inevitably end up. Of course, Lori does not have near the talent that Donald does. But they share some of the same things. When does Spike Lee's documentary come out? It looks like the first episode is out already. And then uh, I guess they'll probably release them week by week. It looks like. I want to see the lost footage of the Spike Lee documentary. And I hope it was truly offensive. Because it's all gone, I hope it was the most offensive thing. Mm -hmm. I hope it was Spike Lee and Louis Farrakhan just talking about Jews for 30 minutes to a point where HBO goes, we're uncomfortable. Because if it was anything other than that, I think it should be in the documentary. Mm -hmm. You know? But I just, you know, what if 30 minutes is just so unhinged? Spike Lee's just talking about flat earth. He's just like, listen, we live on a disc. (laughs) HBO's like, wait a minute. This doesn't seem to, this has nothing to do with 9-11. A few decades ago, private citizens used to be largely that, private. What's changed the internet? Ben uses this. It's so important that you have a, a VPN. All the things you browse, search for, watch, tweeted, all the data is crawled through, collected, and aggregated by third parties in a permanent public record, your record. Having your private life exposed to others to see uh, that was something once only celebrities worried about, but now it's happening to everybody. So you need ExpressVPN, Okay. ExpressVPN is great. It is a virtual private network. Scrambles your IP address so people don't know where you are searching from. It's so important. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location. But ExpressVPN, the connection gets rerouted to an encrypted server, and my IP address is masked. Every time I turn ExpressVPN on, I'm given a random IP address shared by other ExpressVPN customers. That makes it more difficult for third parties to identify me and harvest my data. And the best part is how easy ExpressVPN is to use, no matter what device you're on, phone, laptop, smart TV. All you have to do is tap one button to get protected. So if you, like me, believe your data is your business, secure yourself with number one rated VPN on the market. ExpressVPN.com slash Tim Dillon and get three extra months for free. That's ExpressVPN.com slash Tim Dillon and get three extra months for free. ExpressVPN.com slash Tim Dillon. I'll tell you, is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? 
BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise available that may not be locally available in many areas. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly or video phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit around in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they can make it easy and free to change counselors if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash Tim D. And join over the one million people who've taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people are choosing BetterHelp in all 50 states that they're recruiting more counselors all the time. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Tim Dillon Show listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Tim D. It's been fun uh, being back out on the road post uh, having COVID. And when I had COVID, this is what I was trying to say before. When you have COVID at 36, you go, yeah, I could drop dead, right? Mm-hmm. I could die. And, and, and statistically, you know, probably with the vaccine, you won't or whatever is what they say. But any, anything like that, you go, I could die. When you're laying there in bed going, this could take a turn for the worst, and I could die, you start realizing the value of existing and how many people are on this planet but don't exist. You know what I mean? Like, they don't exist. And they don't exist. It's, it's, it's not because they shouldn't or they don't have the value as human beings. They don't allow themselves to exist. They don't allow themselves to be the person that they potentially could be if they had a little bit of guts, a little bit of balls. But even beyond that, if they just stop giving a fuck Stop adapting. Stop pretending you like things you don't. Stop pretending things make sense to you when they don't. When things don't make sense, go, that doesn't make sense to me. Yes, it'll upset people, probably, depending on what you're saying doesn't make sense. If it's a configuration of hors d'oeuvres, it might not upset people. When it's 9-11, it will. But that's okay. But you go, because you could drop dead tomorrow, and would you want to be remembered for something or would you want people to say like that person really was like a person like that motherfucker you were a defined person you existed you had beliefs and thoughts and you 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 came to them through a journey and some of them evolved and changed but you stuck to them you weren't completely wishy why i respect and let me be careful about how i say this can I be careful about how I say this? Who do you respect more? Your aunt who's on another diet every week or a fat pig shoving a hoagie down their throat? Who do you respect more? Your friend who started reading about politics 16 minutes ago and is now an expert on international relations or the Taliban? Who do you respect more? Who do you respect more? Somebody who's trying to be something that everybody will like. Or Lori Lightfoot, a demon sent to earth from hell. I know. I know who I respect. You can decide who you respect. There's nothing worse than like somebody who's wishy-washy. And I, I've changed my mind. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind. But it comes from a core idea of what is and isn't real. We're barely talking about right and wrong anymore. We're talking about reality. And that's the other thing people don't realize. It's not even a right and wrong paradigm. It's reality or wherever you are. Whatever planet you're on. It's very, very interesting. But we hope you come see us live. UK shows are going to be announced soon. 
So everybody who's a fan in the United Kingdom, Scotland, Ireland, the UK, we may be coming hopefully as soon as January. Wouldn't that be amazing? If you're coming as soon as January, wouldn't this be amazing? We don't know yet. We're trying. And that is happening. The Beacon Theater in New York City is almost sold out. And I will say this. This is kind of wild, right? I usually don't do the emotional, like, the journey is so beautiful, because I just don't do that, right? I don't do that. I don't, I don't tell you to vote. I don't tell you to get vaccinated. I don't tell you to be a good father. I don't tell you to be a good friend. I don't tell you to watch your children. I don't tell you to read. I don't tell you to have interest. I don't tell you to be honest. I don't tell you to respect the cops. I don't tell you to respect criminals. I don't tell you to get a good job and provide for your family. I don't tell you to finish college. I don't tell you not to do drugs. I don't tell you not to drink. I don't tell you to do drugs. I don't tell you to drink. I don't tell you to get a rescue dog. I don't tell you to abuse animals. I don't tell you to donate money to abused animal shelters. The reason I don't do any of that is I don't give a fuck. <laughs> you understand? You're going to do what you do anyway, okay? That's what people have always done. People make a lot of money telling you what to do, and that's great. And you keep giving them that money because money's got to go somewhere. But my only interest is making you laugh and occasionally think. So I tend not to get on some big, like, you can do it. Just believe and try and go and you go. Because... You probably can't do it, whatever it is, right? The reason you think you can do it is because you're insane. You're either on too many or not enough drugs. Mm -hmm. But there are things you can do, and I don't know what they are. So I can't give a vague blanket Gary Vee statement and say, you can do it. That might mean kidnapping a child. I don't know what's in your head. You can do it. Some guy goes, great, and they run into a school with an Uzi. I don't want that on my conscience. So you see how I keep it. But I will say, I will just say that it is cool to start doing comedy 11 years ago in a coffee house in Long Island, New York, and to sell out the Beacon Theater. That is really cool. I'm not going to make any type of, you know, I'm not going to thank all of you because you had nothing to do with it. You understand? You understand? Okay. Didn't have anything to do with it. Okay? Ben does. But you don't. You have something to do with it in a tangential way, sure. And I love comics. And God bless. And listen, if you, there's so many more inspirational, motivational, better. Like, I get it. And am I grateful that you buy tickets to my show? Yes. But I want to make you laugh. If I thank you too much, I feel like I don't have to do my job. I have a job to do, and I try to do it. And I think our interaction makes sense. You give me money, I give you content, you think it's funny, we move on, maybe we meet each other in real life. Maybe you come to my show and you're good looking and you send me a picture of yourself and then you say you don't want to hook up with me uh, but you'd like fuck my opener. And then I'm like, wait, what? This isn't the way it works, you know? Also, come out of the closet, no one cares. You're 24. Anyway, point is this. What I'm saying is that it is cool that I, I get to do that. I feel lucky that I get to do it. Obviously, whatever, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but it's a cool thing if you guys want to be there and there will be no moment in the show where there's any like emotional, like, I just want to say <laughs> that you gave me the... Shut up. Shut up. In a few years, I'm going to end up like brandishing a gun in a diner. How silly will it look that that's my ultimate inevitable end? How silly will it look me getting emo at the Beacon Theater and telling everyone I love them when I just know, because I'm Irish and because I am me, that there is very little chance I make it out of this without brandishing a gun at a diner. And I'd rather people go back to the earlier things I've done and said he had such self-awareness. He even predicted that he would brandish a weapon in an eatery. And he was right. You see, it's about consistency. But if you want to be a part of the Beacon Theater audience, we're doing a great show there. There aren't a lot of tickets sold out. I mean, there's not a lot of tickets left, which is pretty damn cool. That whatever we're doing here is resonating with people. That's cool. 
But I'm not going to be like, you know, a whole new world. You know, it's it's fine. I Everyone on YouTube does that. Every social media person is, and I watch, you know, some of these social media guys, and they were like, it's just me and you forever. We built this forever. It's like all these social media, you know, people. And I just feel like, I just want to tell all of you listening right now, we did not build this together. I don't even know who you are, truly. And I think that's why you listen to this show. Because I think you're fed up with people you don't know telling you that you built something with them and you did something together. We did very little together. Very little together. But we have a good interaction. We have a fair interaction. It's fair. It's fair. I give you something, you give me something. There's fairness to it. And I think that that is, I think that's all we can ask for. That's all we can ask for, you know? Uh, but this is what it is, folks. This is where we're at. We're, we're, we're lucky enough to do some really, really cool shit. And I think the Beacon Theater is maybe one of the coolest things I've done. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Rogan Alex Jones might beat it, to be honest. That's just because of the medium, though. 30 million people. I mean, that's just big, right? The Beacon, you know, be 2,600 self-entitled New York cunts. You know, I'm excited about it. I just, let's be honest. I have to call a spade a spade. I mm -hmm. just wish the Beacon Theater was located in like, you know, I don't know, Rochester or some, you know, some hellish. I just need these Upper West Side cunts to walk in and be like, I don't really, whatever. It's fine. I get it. Just be a bunch of people at, you know, at diners afterwards going like, I get like what he's doing. I get what he's doing. I get why it works. And then at that point, I walk into that diner with a gun. And I, and I say, hey, how are you? And I grab their hand. And they look a little, they're like halfway happy and halfway scared. Because they don't know if it's real yet. And neither do I. But I just looked at them and I said, I want to let you know we built this together. And then I blow my brains out <laughs> on the diner table. And my brain matter goes in all of their food. Because that's what we built together. That's truly what we built together. Okay? That's what we built. The inevitable decay of our minds and our bodies that we fight is coming. The only thing we're building together is death. Truly. And that's what I would say to those rich, entitled cunts and by the way, thank you for buying tickets. I don't, I'm not, I'm just saying, I have a weird relationship with New York right now. Some of it I love. I love some of it. And then some of it I just, you know. You know, it's missing a Lori Lightfoot. Our mayor, Bill de Blasio, is not uh, cartoonish in a funny way. Mm. He's not. He's just, it's just stupid. And it's embarrassing. To bring it, to bring it full circle, you don't have many choices in this world. You don't. There's a few different people you can be. You can be the limo driver who gets yelped about, or you could be the liar yelping about the limo driver. There's other options. There's other configurations. There's shades in between. But those are kind of the two. I mean, it's the haves and the have-nots, right? I mean, there's disparities. It's sad. I don't like it. It's the way it is. For the moment, things may change, you know? And, you know, you could be the person that says, I bet the official story of 9-11 is 100% accurate. And by the way, if we're not going to include any of the skepticism uh, of the official narrative in the documentary. What is the documentary again? Trauma porn. Jerking off to people jumping out of the buildings. Yeah, talking to victims, the, the families of people that died. Who in it and crying gives it. a fuck about that? Who wants to hear that? Truly. Is there anything new? Is there anything new... Or are we just going to go on about the same nonsense? 
It is a tragic day, and a lot of great people died, and that's fucking horrible. But I don't know that we need to endlessly relive it unless we're going to relive it with a little bit of a, a cold, sober, emotionless look at it. But we don't want that. See, the last thing we want is to look at any of these events without emotion because then they don't make any sense. You see? You understand? The chaos serves a purpose. The chaos is the point. The chaos is the point. The point is not, how did Afghanistan get so bad? It's the point. <laughs> Do you understand? Why does Lori Lightfoot not know what she's dressing and she's a goon? She knows. It's the point. It's the point. What, what, is it, what is confusing and perplexing you is the point. Do you understand? What you look at and go, why? People are putting out there hoping that you are in that state of confusion, panic. You don't understand. You're not supposed to understand. In fact... You're not supposed to understand to the degree that you give up. That you give up even trying to understand. That's why people's behavior is so insane. And then you go, oh, wait a minute. Teenagers act out. It's, it's for the purpose of acting out. They want you to be thrown by their moods. Their mood swings, yes, hormonal, but they have control over them. But, you know, they're like, you don't understand me. And slamming the door and they're goth one day and they're whatever, a stoner the next day. And they're trying on all these different identities. They don't know who you are, but they just want attention. The point is that eventually you give up and let them be a person. That's the point, is that eventually you as a parent go, hey, she'll figure it out, or he'll figure it out, okay? That's the point. That's the point here. The chaos that unfolds is the actual point. And when you wrap your head around that idea, and the media's job is to sell the chaos like a new TV show that has season premieres and season finales and hooks and reveals and there's and there's stakes and there's things that are, and there's many moving parts and it's all we're all just trying to figure it out so that things can go back to peace but we don't want that we want things uh, the people the powers that be, the idea that like anybody wants things to make sense ever again. If things made sense, these people would not only be out of a job, many of them would be on death row. <laughs> Truly. So in order for the world to keep going, things actually can't ever make sense again. Ever. So their investment, their investment is making sure that the leaders have balloon pants and they're crazy and their spectacles and the chaos is entertaining and you're watching, but you give up trying to make sense out of it because that is the biggest threat, making sense of this nightmare, you will then have the clarity to go, wait a minute, something is rotten. Something's very wrong here. But not if things stay turbulent. You know, in bad turbulence on a flight, you don't go, where the fuck's my drink? What's going on? Bad turbulence, you just, you, you grab the seat and you pray, and you look out the window, and you hope to God that whatever force is keeping the plane in the air, whatever it is, whatever force you want to call that, you hope that that holds up. You hope that that is real. You hope that the thing keeping you 
above the ground exists. You can't see it, feel it. You don't understand it. You didn't listen in that class. You don't get it. You have a rudimentary understanding of science, morally, more biology, because you like Googled your dick, but you don't understand physics or you don't get it. But you're, you're hoping, you're grabbing the, 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 the seat and, and that's the, the point we're in now. We're kind of grabbing the seat and at a certain point in extreme turbulence, you actually give up. You'll actually give up and resign yourself to death. Truly. And I've talked to people that have been in bad turbulence where they go, a peace washes over you because you're getting ready to die. You are getting ready to actually leave your body. You've made peace with it. You've had the moment. Your life has ran through your eyes. You're, you're, you're there and the plane is pitching and weaving and it's very, very bad and you're looking at the stewardesses and they're crying. And, and, and at that moment, when you're on that plane, the only thing that you're going to be happy that you did was said, listen, bitch, we have the fucking camera. The driver never entered your fucking house. You're a fucking liar. You're going to be happy you did that. That's the only thing you're going to be happy you did. Okay? The chaos is the point. But every now and then, you can even say fuck you to that. 